Good morning, Mary. Good morning. How are Mary. you? She's staying up. We uh, can't see her. We uh, went through the uh, Valley of Vision already. I don't think you were with us when we did that. So, yeah. uh, but we're ready to get started. I have, uh, uh, I have something I want to give everybody. You might, you might know this, um, but in case you don't, or if you just need a little reminder on it, you know, uh, there is always this thing that goes around at this time of year about keeping Christ in Christmas, and it's based. Uh, it's sort of like a uh, uh, a response, a reaction to Xmas. And so this is a this is just a thing that RC wrote about the fact that the X in Christmas in, in Xmas is not a bad thing because it's actually the way that over the centuries Christ has been identified in a shorthand term term and it's it's uh, because it, it's the Greek letter for Christ Chi and um, uh, it basically is like RC starts this out and says, R is my initial. My name is, is Robert. R is my initial. But uh, the X is Christ's initial. So uh, in, in this, because it's actually based on the Chi. It's not the X of the English language. Right. It's the Chi. And so just a little information on that. The other thing is, Mary, thank you for uh, recommending the... Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis movie. I watched it. It's very good. I would recommend it to anybody. Uh, the problem is it's going to cost you 20 bucks to watch it online. Wow. Uh, but it is well worth it. If you're going to spend money to go to a theater, oh. you know, if you spend money to go to a theater, you're going to spend, what, 20 bucks between, you know, for a couple. Seniors. Uh, well, whatever, you know, but you're going to spend, you're going to spend, you're going to spend money. If I don't want to biography on his life. Actually, yes. Um, and it's, it's mm -hmm. done in a, in a dramatic manner. And uh, Max McLean plays the part. If you know who Max McLean is, he's, he does a lot of the narrations and uh, he's the voice in a lot of the uh, Bible readings and things that you get. And um, he, uh, uh, he plays the part of, C.S. Lewis in it, and he's there. He'll be, he's sort of like uh, overseeing what's going on, and he's talking about what goes on, and then they direct, uh, they do it dramatically, so he'll be standing in a room while stuff is going on, and he'll be explaining what, what's going on. So it's, it's very interesting. It's very good, and I think, you know, I think about this inner conflict, that he was so, he was very conflicted, uh, and was an atheist. He was involved in the occult, um, I guess at one point in his life, he, he was a womanizer, you know, so, uh, so he was great, greatly conflicted. And um, uh, as this says, and it, it really comes to and really, I, it, it made me think a lot. <laughs> so I would recommend it. The thing about it is you can only see it for the rest of this week online. So uh, which, 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 What's the name of it again? Um, the uh, it, it's uh, C.S. Lewis, the reluctant convert. It's in a big article in the Epic Times about. You know who was instrumental in leading him to the Lord? Um, J. R. R. Tolkien. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. The little Hobbit. The little Hobbit. <laughs> so Mary, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I thought it was a good movie. Yes. I'm sure it is. Yes. So. The four but you can always God. invite, you always can invite other people to make it. <laughs> a little more cost effective. Yeah, that's, that's true. Sure. Yeah. So if I had known, you know, if I had known, it, it, it's only good for three days. Yeah. So. Did you get it through Prime or were you good? No, you have to go to the website. If you Google the movie. Oh, okay. So it will take you to the website, the website uh, for the uh, organization that did it. Okay. So and that's where you get it. So anyway. Well, the foreknowledge of God, um, of course, uh, great topic. Oh, there we go. Um, this is a little bit uh, extended here, but this is RC. God knows both the micro and macro dimensions of the entire universe. He numbers the very hairs of our head. 
Not only does he know what we will do before we do it, but also he knows all the options we can have at the moment. Um, he knows all contingencies, yet God's knowledge of contingencies is not itself contingent. You get that? Yes. Okay. Um, he is not a great chess player who must wait to see what we will do, but he knows absolutely what we will do before we do it. Before a word is even formed on our lips, he knows it all together. And of course, his famous quote is, there's no um, uh, uh, random, random molecules, molecules uh, in, in the universe. It's all. He knows it all. So let's uh, move on to the video. In this session, we want to talk about a very important attribute of God, which is the foreknowledge of God. There's a lot of misunderstanding um, on this subject of the foreknowledge of God, and some people's understanding of foreknowledge is this, that God is looking down the proverbial tunnel of time to see what will men do with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And based upon what God foresees, God will then make a reciprocal choice towards them. If God sees in the future that someone will believe upon His Son, Jesus Christ, God foresees that, and when He foresees that person believing in Christ, God will then, from eternity past, uh, ordain them unto salvation. Unfortunately, that is 180 degrees in the wrong direction. That is a, a, a significant misinterpretation of Scripture. And for three reasons. Number one, God has never looked into the future and learned anything. God is omniscient. We've already covered that attribute. God knows all things. God never learns anything. God never looks into the future and ever sees anyone do anything that He has not already foreordained. Second, if all God does is look into the future to see what someone will do, and that's all that foreknowledge is, this is what God will foresee. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. All God will see is that no one will believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches the total depravity of the human heart. The Bible teaches the bondage of the will. And the Bible teaches that repentance and saving faith is a gift that God must bestow to the guilty sinner. No one can believe on their own. But third, foreknowledge does not mean foresight because in Romans 8 and verse 29 it says, for those whom He foreknew. Let me tell you two things about this, which I guess would be number three and four on our list. It's a personal pronoun, for those whom He foreknew. It doesn't say what He foresaw. It says, whom He foreknew. God is not foreseeing events. God is not foreseeing circumstances. God is not foreseeing conversion experiences in Romans 8, 29. It doesn't say what He foresaw. It says, whom He foreknew. So number four on why that is wrong is a gross misunderstanding of what the word foreknowledge means. The word foreknowledge in the original language, and we would never know this in the English, the word foreknowledge is a verb with a prefix that is placed in front of the main verb. The main verb is gnosko, which means to know. To know in a personal love relationship, to love in a very intimate way. It speaks of the love between a husband 
and a wife in a very physical relationship. To know that spouse as you would know no one else in the world. The prefix that is put in front of gnosko is pro, P-R-O, which means before. It sounds like pre. The word is prognosko. Pro means beforehand. The word foreknowledge, prognosko, means those whom God previously chose to love with a distinguishing love in ways that He does not love others. Let's just do a Bible study. Let's just survey the entire Bible on this, okay? So I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. Let's start in Genesis, okay? And I want you to see how the word know, K-N-O-W, how the word know is used as it first appears in the Scripture. This is written in the Hebrew language, and instead of gnosko, it's the word um, yada. Now, Genesis 4, verse 1, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. This verb, had relations with, we understand what this means. It's a very discreet, modest way for the Bible to speak of this physical union between a man and his wife. Literally, in the original language, this says, the man knew his wife, and she conceived, and she gave birth. The word to know in the Bible, K-N-O-W, means to love in the most intimate relationship where there is a close bond and it is an expression of indistinguishable love. To love this one in ways that I do not love others. To set your heart upon to love with distinguishing affection. Only as we understand this, it's repeated in verse 25 in Genesis chapter 4. Um, Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. All of this is to set up for you that when we come in the New Testament, to the word foreknowledge. We must understand what the word know means, K-N-O-W. It does not, it does not mean foresight. Eve would have never become pregnant with just foresight. (laughs) It took a little more than that. It took an intimate love relationship, a connection. Come with me to the book of Amos, to Amos 3 and verse 2. And here I want you to see that the word to know is used synonymously with the word to be chosen, to be chosen to be loved. In Amos 3 and verse 2, we read, God speaking to Israel, "'You only have I chosen.'" among all the families of the earth. Now, that word chosen, in my Bible, I have, there's a, um, a little one, and out in the margin it gives the proper uh, translation of that word, and it says, to know. To know is to choose. To know is to choose to love. To know is to choose to love with distinguishing love. God says, I don't love all the families of the nations the way I love Israel. 
You only have I chosen. You only have I loved. You, my chosen people. I have loved you in ways that I have not loved the Egyptians. I have loved you in ways that I have not loved the Babylonians. And I have not loved the Assyrians. I have demonstrated my love towards you. I have sent the prophets. I have given my covenants to you. I have given my truth to you. I have done so much more for you. The word to know means to choose to love in a very distinguishing, we would say discriminating way. Now, come to the New Testament. Come to Matthew chapter 1. I want to show you something that will, if you don't already know this, this this little verse will, as we would say in Alabama, rock your socks, okay? (laughs) Matthew chapter 1 and verse 25 I'll begin, the sentence begins in verse 24, Matthew 1, 24. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, verse 25, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. Literally, in fact, it's in the margin of my New American Standard Bible. It, it, it really means she was not known. By Joseph. It just comes into our English translation, uh, transliterated. It's not an actual translation. It's just uh, a dynamic equivalent at that point, and it just says, kept her a virgin. Uh, the word virgin does not even appear in the original language. That's a whole different Greek word. All it says is, Joseph never knew her, and she was never known by Joseph. That's what it means to be a virgin. You're not known by a man. No, you're known about, you're just not known in an intimate, special, distinguishing, connecting, love relationship. When we come to Romans 8, verse 29, this is going to become abundantly clear. Now, don't go there yet because I've got some other verses to show you. Turn with me to Matthew 7, 23. We're at the end of the greatest sermon that's ever been preached by the greatest preacher who's ever lived. It is the Sermon on the Mount. It is the preacher is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to add, he's the greatest evangelist who ever lived. And we come to the end of this sermon, and you know what it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the way is broad, and the, and the gate is wide that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. The gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. And now we come down to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's not saying we're saved by obedience, but there will always be the evidence of true salvation in our obedience as well as the command of the gospel in the imperative verb is believe. Now, you either obey that or you don't obey that. The command of the gospel is repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you're a believer, you are an obeyer. If you're an unbeliever, you are a disobeyer. That's the meaning of verse 25. Now, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Lord, I went to church. Lord, I taught in Sunday school. Lord, I, I served you. You know me, Lord. Lord, Lord, do you remember me? Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never, what? (laughs) Now, God knows the number of the hairs of their head. God knows the day of their birth. God knows every word they've said. What does this mean, I never knew you? It means we never had a relationship. I never intimately knew you. All I, knew, all I knew really was about you. You were too distant from me. You never responded to my overtures of grace. I never knew you. And you never knew me. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Could anything be any more obvious? What the word no means, K N O W? means to have a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
Come to John chapter 10. This will become, I think, even more clear if the noonday sun needed to be any more clear. John chapter 10, I want you to see verse 14 and a couple other verses here. John 10, verse 14. It's the parable of the good shepherd. I, I, I love this, ch- this entire chapter. Um, Jesus represents himself to us as the good shepherd. Let me just confine myself to this verse, verse 14. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. That's good. Now, what do you think no means? You think that means Jesus is saying, I know your social security number? I got your credit ratings? No. When he says, I know you, he means, and you know me? That we have an intimate, personal, saving relationship. It's not just that you know about me. You actually know me. And you know what's more important than for you to know God is for God to know you. It's for Jesus Christ to know you. I want to ask you this question. We've been together here now for a little while. Do you know the Lord? Does the Lord know you? I didn't ask you to go to church. I didn't ask you, do you love Ligonier? I didn't ask you, do you know R.C.'s birthday? Do you know the Lord? Does Jesus Christ know you? Because if you don't, you will hear Him say to you one day, depart from me, you who work iniquity. To know means to enter into a personal, saving, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 27, across the page. This is like one of these dimmer switches. You just keep turning it up in the dining room and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, okay? Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Gnosko, to know means to have a saving love relationship with. What does foreknowledge mean? It means that before time began, before the foundation of the world, in eternity past, God drew a circle around your name and He singled you out and He chose to love you and He set His heart upon you with blazing, burning love and affection. He he entered into a saving love relationship with you by His eternal covenant from before the foundation of the world, and He wrote your name in His Lamb's book of life before time began. You are mine, and I have set my heart upon you And I love you with an everlasting love. That's what the word foreknowledge means. Come to Acts 2, verse 23. There are a few places in the Bible where foreknowledge is synonymous with foreordination, which is just a synonym for predestination. And in Acts 2, verse 23, as Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost... In verse 23, he throws out this heavy. He goes down deep. This wasn't a little gospel ditty wanting easy believism and putting out some cheap grace. This was a strong message. And he says in verse 23, this man, referring to Jesus Christ, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God predetermined the cross. Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. God had marked out His own Son. He chose His Son to be the Savior and the Redeemer and the Reconciler of the elect of God at Calvary's cross. And as Jesus went 
to the cross. He was foreloved by God the Father. This was His beloved Son in whom He was well pleased. And the Father had set His distinguishing love upon His Son, Jesus Christ, as He was going in obedience to the cross to die in our place. Do you think that this means that God the Father just looked down the tunnel of time to see what His Son would do? And I have no idea what He's going to do. Oh my goodness, they just arrested him. Oh my word, they just took him before Pilate. What's going to happen? What's this? He has a cross in his hand. Oh, he, he's having to give it to Simon. He can't carry it. Oh, this situation is out of control. I foresee this now. Well, I guess I better make lemonade out of lemons. I'll just adopt this and make this my plan of salvation because everything got out of control. You know what? That's just blasphemy. Let's just call it for what it is. It's blasphemy. Now, God the Father had set His heart upon God's Son, and He set His heart upon His elect, and He gave His elect to the Son as a love gift that the Son would come into this world and go to the cross, and there the beloved Son of God the Father would suffer under the wrath on behalf of sinners. Quickly come to 1 Peter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Turn to it as quickly as you can. And I want you to see foreknowledge used twice in the same chapter. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout in all these cities at the end of verse 1, who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And someone will go, oh, wait a minute. It's foreknowledge that is the controlling factor on chosen. Not so fast. Turn to verse 20 before you answer that way. In verse 20 we read, For he, the antecedent of he is at the, at the end of the previous verse, verse 19, Christ, the blood of Christ. For he, this is referring to Jesus Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. What do you think that means? Do you think that means God just looked passively down the tunnel of time to see what would happen to the Lord Jesus and, and that he would then integrate that into his plan, whatever that would be? He'll have to wait and see what happens. No, what this means in verse 20 is that from before time began, the Father so loved His own Son and set His heart. He chose to love His Son with extraordinary love. Whatever you do to verse 20, you're going to have to do to verse 2. However you understand the foreknowledge of the Father of the Son in verse 20, you will have to understand as the foreknowledge of the Father towards the elect. Now what this means in verse, verses 1 and 2 is that those who were chosen by the Father were chosen because of the distinguishing love, the electing love, the sovereign love that the Father has for the Son, for, for all of the elect. Now, Romans 9, verse 13 says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Sounds like distinguishing love to me. In love, He predestined us to the adoption of sons. What does foreknowledge mean? It couldn't be any more clear. It means those whom He foreloved, whom He chose to love, in eternity past with a distinguishing affection. Those whom He foreknew, He predestined. In whom He predestined, He called. In whom He called, He justified. In whom He justified, He glorified. That is why when we get to heaven and we are crowned, that crown will stay on our head for about five seconds. And we're going to cast it back at His feet signifying that all things are from you and through you and to you. You chose me. You redeemed me. You called me. You predestined me. What's this crown doing on my head? It is back at your feet. This is the meaning of the foreknowledge of God.
Think about that. <laughs> I did when I first the uh, first year I started coming to the church here from over to a reform position. I started to do the sun look at the central tenets of Calvin as a, and I started to do a study on it. And this was a, I looked up that word, Krogonosko, and every time it's used of God, it means a relational knowledge. I found that out. It is used of, uh, of they know something ahead of time, but it's not used of God as individual people. So then I realized that God knew me and all of us in a relational way before we existed, before we had being, our being existed in the mind of God from all eternity as individuals. That's a, a sobering thought. It's true, but it's hard to get your comprehended reality. So before I existed, I had being in God's mind. He knew of me. Because that's the key that unlocks that whole, I did a study on Romans 8, Foreknowledge is the key that unlocks that whole chain of salvation. I thought that was a great lecture. I, I, I learned something every time I listen. <laughs> Mary, any comments? I can't hear very well. I don't know what's wrong. Oh, okay. Very, very, very soft. Oh, okay. Um. Not sure what the problem there was, but uh, uh, she heard a lecture. Did, were you able to hear the lecture? Oh yes. Oh, but okay. I had to, I had to strain. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, how do you respond to uh, the lecture? Well, I certainly learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 you know, to to uh, foreknowledge is intimate relationship with God's intimate relationship with his saved. And that's yes. just, that was just a, I always wondered what that meant before. Well, you know, it, we think in simple terms. And so the simplest way that we can uh, think about this is that, uh, uh, I'm going to try to get everybody up here. There we go. Um, the simplest way that we look at it is, oh, foreknowledge. You know, it's it's that idea. And so the first, I think the, the first thoughts that we get about foreknowledge are the idea that, oh, he just knows what's going to happen because he sees it in the future. future. Sure. And that's that's what that's how we tend to uh, to view it. But then when you get into the, to the way that the Holy Spirit wrote this stuff through the, through, uh, uh, through the various people, you know, I mean, he, he takes us from, from Genesis uh, through uh, the Old Testament into the New Testament, and we get this uh, definition of foreknowledge uh, really uh, uh, given to us in a way that is so much deeper than what we would just think about it. So, so when somebody hasn't done a study, when somebody hasn't gone in and looked at it, then the whole thing of predestination doesn't work. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing of predestination doesn't work. So, uh, yeah, so we're, you know, this was, this was really, uh, uh, in depth, what, the three things that he talked about that were um, that that were about the uh, about foreknowledge. Uh, what were they? You recall? Uh, no, no. The the three things that well, they would be misunderstandings. But when he was saying how you do, you define it. There were three uh, things, and, and the first was the relational intimacy. And what did you think when he was talking about the knowledge of Mary and Joseph? That was pretty interesting when you think about that, that he 
Yeah, it wasn't, they didn't have a relational, they didn't have an right. intimate relationship. They didn't consummate right. the marriage. Right. It was after. not her. Yeah, it was right. not intimate. Right. So the first one was, was, was intimacy. What, do you remember what the second one was? Are we going to be marked? I mean, it's, I mean it's I'm looking at my notes. Well, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm looking I forward to whether or not. Yeah, I'm looking forward to whether or not. It's personal. It's personal, like you said there. Yeah. Is on it's a personal now. Where he never looks into the future and learns anything. Very good show. No, I'm reading from my notes. Awesome. <laughs> I want to take credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have, but I can't. It's it's the distinguished thing. It's the same way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's very definite. Right. He knows us as individuals. Yeah. Before we were individuals. Right. Very interesting. And then what was the third one? Choosing. Person. Choosing. Choosing. Saving. Okay, saving. Uh -huh. I know you can't see who's married, Mary, but uh, I am writing on a board. <laughs> okay, what was the first one? Intimacy. It's an intimate relationship. And even as we go further and hear what he says when he talks about, um, I knew you not, he's talking about the fact that these folks that come to Jesus and say, oh, look what I did for you. Jesus is saying, no, I didn't have an intimate relationship with you. That The implications of that verse are really, uh, that, uh, that may be, in my mind, the hardest verse in the New Testament. It means that I was, I was pastoring a church. It means that I can have people in that church that are doing the mechanics of the faith. Right. They're faithful. They come every Sunday. They teach. They clean. They do everything. They may not be saved. Right. You can you can devote your life and do the mechanics of the faith and not be saved. Yeah. That would worry me. When, when you talk about this intimate relationship on how the Holy Spirit has worked on you, and that helps you to understand the intimacy that you have with, with right. God. That's that's what seals that intimacy. And one of the things he talked about was how in this intimate relationship, you know God and God knows you. Okay, and you know that. And I think back to people, and I, and I keep going back to, to this Sunday school class where the guy said, you cannot know that you're saved. That, I, that, this sort of says to me, that guy probably wasn't saved. So I would ask Steve if, if I could talk to him if he was here. Expound on what it means to know. What are, the, what are the particulars of this knowing? How can I know that I know? Do I know about God? Or I don't know, and I think it will come down to obedience. Yeah. But that's important, too. I mean, someone can be sitting there going, do I know God? No, I want to know. Yeah, he asked the question several times. Do you know God, or does right. God know you? Yeah. That would be a. You get kind of messed up in your brain. Oh. What was the third third thing, Dennis? I'm sorry. The third thing was it's a saving relationship. Thank you. Okay. Um. Since. And here's since God's foreknowledge is perfect and doesn't change. What motivation do Christians have for evangelism? Because we don't know. God knows, but we don't right. know. Right. We, we don't yeah. know if a person's saved or not. That's right. I, so we it, we don't we're not God. So we we in faith evangelize because maybe God's going to use us to yeah. you know stay right. get them He's saved. Well, and, and, yeah. and, and there's a, there's another very important reason, probably more important than what you just said, not just. Right. To, no, no, that's I know. What's what most is important is yeah. he tells us we need to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's he tells us. Um, but your point is well, right. We don't cool. know who is saved or not. So R C right. says, which I think this is great. I have never met anybody that I don't think is elect. Exactly. Because what he is saying there is, it's not up to me to figure it out. And I certainly should not think that somebody's not elect. Right. Okay. Because what we should be doing is taking and evangelizing that person. Amen. Uh, how can God's eternal foreknowledge encourage believers in a time of sorrow? Because if we know that He knows us, He knows what we're going through. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. So he'll be there through the whole thing. And, and, you know, the ultimate sadness that we experience is the loss of somebody yes. close to us. But if we understand that God's foreknowledge is predestina predestinating plan is perfect, then we need to understand that in the midst of our sorrow, we have to understand that God measured the days of that person. I was joking the other day, uh, you know, we've been married for 48 years. What, what do you get for Christmas for somebody that's been married 48 years? So we said, don't get anything, just get something that we can open, you know? So uh, uh, Marilyn got me a calendar and I was joking saying, well, maybe my days are numbered. <laughs> well, actually my days are numbered. Uh, actually, my days are numbered. Well, and so, so I went very carefully through the calendar to see if there were any dates circled. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that I have no all. What, what would this be circled for? Oh, <laughs> um, many struggle with the knowledge that God foreknows certain individuals but not others. How can you help people see that God's foreknowledge magnifies his character rather than diminishes it? How can we help people see? Well, I mean, this gets into the issue of the sovereignty of God. Uh -huh. uh, you know, his foreknowledge and his pre-election of certain individuals and not others is part of his sovereignty. Yeah. You know, I choose you, but I not choose you because that's what I want to do. Right. That's my will. And you can't go any further than that because we have our system of fairness and our balance on scales, and it doesn't work with our particular. This is the big problem with our friends and Lincoln Patty, who are dear, dear Christian friends, but they are Arminians to the core of their being, and they cannot accept the fact that God would choose somebody and not choose anybody else because he yeah. wants to. It's a hard concept, yeah. but that's why we're not God. That's right. <laughs> have you known other Christians who don't adhere to the definition of foreknowledge presented in both lessons you yes. just mentioned? Okay. Okay. And uh, lovely people. Love the word. Christ. Fred and F. Yeah. F. Yeah. Fred and F. Uh, <laughs> You have to be able to understand that. Oh, right? I think I got that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, obviously, we have we do know people, um, uh, and 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 our prayer needs to be that somehow we can share with them these truths. Um, well, here's a question, then, as our teacher, and so. Our two friends, Mike and Patty, would not grasp this concept. Are they saved? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't have a problem. It's not that. a salvation. This doctrinal position is not necessarily yeah. a salvation. What, 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 is the, what is the defining uh, issue of whether or not somebody is saved? It's whether, faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, yeah. whether they can confess him yeah, uh, as as uh, crucified and right. And they did. Uh, do they witness to unbelievers differently? Does somebody that's Armenian witness differently? Sure. Yeah. They say, here's Jesus offering you salvation on a platter, and you need to say this prayer and accept this salvation. Yeah. And, and they're sincere. I've done it on the streets of Poughkeepsie sure. right before I come here. You will need to accept Christ. It's like God is sitting there going, I wonder what they'll do. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think yeah. Steve is right. It almost comes to a level of blasphemy. Yeah. Because yeah. salvation now becomes a word. Yeah. Um, so I, and, and as I said, I think I've said it in here, I think more in terms of the time that I recognized that Jesus was my Savior, that, that I was introduced to him that way. Um, and that's the day that I came to know him. I, I was finally the Holy Spirit sort of introduced me to him instead of saying, "Well, Dennis, uh, you accept him." You know, that God doesn't ask you to do that. So, and but there's something about a profession of faith in front of the congregation 
that somehow seals it in either must be in your spirit or whatever. There's something yeah. about well, that. Well, and that's, that's that, when somebody comes to join the church, that's their public profession. Yeah, it's like a seal yeah. in yeah. your mind and in your heart that this is real. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. And do they talk about the love of God differently? Yes, they do. They do because uh, the big issue in the Lutheran Church is double predestination. By the way, I just saw that an Orthodox Presbyterian Church bought a, an Evangelical Lutheran Church. So oh, the ELCA sold it to, a, to an Orthodox Presbyterian Church ah. up in I think I think I think wow. it's in Ohio. Wow. <laughs> so, um, Okay, what surprised God when he looked into the future? Nothing. Nothing. When Christ speaks of telling certain individuals that he never knew them, what does he mean? He didn't have an intimate relationship with them. That's right. Yep. According to Lawson, the word foreknowledge in Acts 2.23 is a synonym for what other biblical word? Omniscient. I can say the... Uh, you're all wrong. Everyone knew. Okay. Yeah. Foreordination. And he said foreordination is a synonym for what? Predestination. Oh, okay. okay. Why is a correct understanding of the foreknowledge important to the Christian life? C. Yes. It assures us that our salvation depends on God alone. In Romans 8, 29, foreknowledge is very similar in meaning to foresight. No. Yeah, that's false. Mm -hmm. If foreknowledge were God's looking down the tunnel of time to see who would choose him, who would be saved? No. No. I think we're speaking. <laughs> right. yeah. Have, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the... Uh, uh, what do they call that? Total deprivation or my friend. Total depravity. Yes, okay. because we, we are not capable yes. of accepting it. Choose the incorrect statement. For knowledge connotes a relationship and excludes knowledge. Knowledge is closely related to foreordination. For knowledge cannot change. For knowledge was operative before the world began. Oh, the incorrect. Though the incorrect statement. Yes, the incorrect statement was a trick question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Now, we're going to uh, finish this series, and you would think that the series should end I know, I know. on loving God. We're going to figure out, at the end of this, we're going to know why he saved wrath. So we have hell is hot and heaven is not. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. Uh, our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the technology that Mary can be with us today, and we're so thankful for her and uh, her contributions to us and, and her great love for you. And Lord, uh, we thank you that Jesus came so that we can all share in the great love that you have for us from before the foundations of the world even began, before we understood anything, you knew us and loved us. That's just uh, amazing. So, Lord, we come to you today to worship you, and we ask that we can worship you in the knowledge of that, in spirit and truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dennis. Yes. Dennis, is there any news on the people with COVID, how sick they are? Or? Um. I, I don't have any new news, Mary, but there might be some come up in the uh, worship service. Okay. Do you know okay. it, how is Bob doing? Bob's doing better. Um, he's home. He's he's on oxygen, but he is home. So I'm sure there'll be probably an update on that too. All right. Isn't it sad about Frank losing his yes. dad and coming down with COVID? Well, he also, lost a sister, he also lost a sister-in-law. Oh, he did? Yes, yes. So, yeah, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So. All right. Well, we'll probably uh, let you see us in church in a little yes, bit. Yes, I hope so. Okay. Thanks. Think, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you so much. Yes, 
No, he. And Frank lost his father this week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Lost his father. 